Hi, everyone. It's Joe Venary, the host of Fit Insider, the show where I talk with the entrepreneurs, executives, and investors who are redefining the business of fitness and wellness. Today, I'm joined by Brian Riley. Brian is the co-founder and managing partner of Will Ventures, an early stage venture firm focusing on companies across health and wellness, media, and consumer products. In this episode, we discuss the firm's $55 million inaugural fund. We take a closer look at a few of their portfolio companies, including Ello, Lightboxer, and Breathwork. Then Brian talks through untapped opportunities and ideas he'd like to back. A quick reminder before we get into today's show. Every Tuesday, we send a weekly newsletter filled with insights and analysis on the business of fitness and wellness. Join other decision makers and industry operators by subscribing at insider.fit.co. Let's get into it. Hi, Brian. Welcome to Fit Insider. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, brother. I'm excited. Yeah, likewise. Uh, Really looking forward to this conversation. And just to get started, can you introduce yourself and and tell listeners about what you're working on at Will Ventures? Absolutely. And and even before that, I just want to say congrats on all your success because I've been loving the content. I think you guys have been doing a phenomenal job. So I'm co-founder of an early stage venture capital firm called Will Ventures. We're investing in consumer health and media companies. So we're currently investing out of an oversubscribed $55 million fund. And we've been lucky to partner with some exceptional entrepreneurs so far. Our investors at the fund consist of university endowments, professional team owners, and proven entrepreneurs. So we were really fortunate to get a great uh, group of LPs behind us for this first fund. But most importantly, or the, the thing that I want to emphasize is what our name stands for, because it's it's something that matters deeply to our team, uh, which is the power of human will. And when we were naming our firm, you know, my co-founder Isaiah and I, we went back and forth on this and we thought for a long and hard time about what we wanted to stand for uh, over the long haul. And this theme of willpower kept coming up. And if you can believe it, we actually had this name going back to like 2013. And on the personal front, it felt like a good fit. You know, my co-founder came from poverty, He was homeless for parts of his childhood. I'm a first-generation college student. I come from a working-class family. So so both of us always were kindred spirits around this grinder mentality. And then on a professional front, you know, we've been there too. We understand that starting a business is hard, really hard. And I mean, you guys know this firsthand. You, You did it yourselves. And when your credit card debt is rising and your cash account is falling, it gets really stressful. And it takes a special sort of person to have their back against the wall like that and to say, I'm not going to fail. I'm going to find a way to succeed. So ultimately, we wanted to stand for those sorts of entrepreneurs, right? Those that find a way to persevere in the face of all of that adversity. And so our hope, you know, with our name and our culture and what we stand for as a firm was let's attract like-minded people, people around this theme and partner with them for the long haul. Yeah, that's really incredible. And I think, you know, dialing into that point around the, the human will and, and character and what it takes to really start a company and then make it successful. All those things resonate with a founder who's saying like, essentially, I don't want to be in this alone. And a lot of times you hear, you know, oh, it's, you know, not just a check that we're putting in, like, we're going to help you. We're going to be there to make sure we support you and get you to be successful. But, you know, it doesn't always play out that way beyond the check. So it's, it's definitely good to hear, you know, your approach and, and where that name comes from. Thinking about, you know, the investments that you're making, how you came to the focus, the thesis of Will Ventures. Can you just talk a little bit more about the, you know, obviously companies across personalized health, across sports, fitness, what made you arrive at that as the focus and how do you think about the companies that you're investing in? Yeah, absolutely. And it's a great question. So our fund one thesis is that sports are a great proving ground for consumer health and media and innovation. And this has been informed by, you know, my co-founder and I's experience across a couple of different companies. We, we started working together over a decade ago, actually. And so this thesis started germinating in our heads at a company called MC10, uh, which was a digital health was wearables company that was recently acquired, actually. Um, and that company, we were working on wearable technology. And this is like 2010, 2011, right? So it was like the initial peak of the wearable hype. And we were selling products for, you know, consumer health or uh, health and wellness, all the way to chronic disease management using the same platform, right? So we were leveraging the same platform for unregulated and, and regulated products. So it was really this interesting intersection. 
And as all of this health and wellness innovation was coming to market, we saw that sports and fitness were such an interesting tip of the spear, really such like an interesting pressure cooker for these new innovations, because athletes are really the ideal, you know, early adopter. They've got the money to afford it ahead of the mass market. They're financially incentivized, their bodies, their business, right? So they want to trial the latest and greatest. And then lastly, and just more sort of tactically, it's a lot faster selling into those markets than it is selling into hospitals and provider systems. So when we saw that at MC10 through that experience, you know, we looked back in time and saw a recurring model. You know, if you think, think of you know, traditional healthcare innovations like arthroscopic surgery or even x-ray machines, a lot of that pressure tested in elite sports, actually, um, or think even consumer trends like fitness, like you know, sports nutrition. I mean, that's a great example. Sports nutrition has really impacted consumer nutrition in a profound way. So we saw this recurring pattern that was actually not dissimilar from the impact of, say, like NASA or the space program on general society. And when we looked at this in health and wellness, you know, we saw a wave of innovation that was going to come through sports and that we thought sports would be an interesting proving ground. And so that's really uh, informed our focus, which is one half primarily on human performance, right? So think things like consumer healthcare, like fitness, like nutrition, and the other half on media and entertainment, things like esports and gaming, things like fan engagement, like streaming. So as a fund, you know, we're marketed very sports centric, but ultimately we're really investing in consumer. We're investing in health and, and media. For sure. There's a couple of things that come up in there. One of them being this concept of, you know, trickle down health almost. We've tried to capture it in some of the newsletters that we've done. It's come up in the podcast. You spoke of it with respect to nutrition and even, you know, some of the surgical treatments. What factor, I mean, did that factor into what you guys were thinking about in terms of, you know, how do we take these things that are initially engineered for an athlete or a high performing individual, but are we able to, to invest in things that have that breakthrough kind of mainstream appeal to the levels that they can be a venture backed company, right? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think there's now a lot of precedents from the Fitbits of the world and more recently the Whoops of the world, right, that have shown this model, particularly on the healthcare side. But this goes back for decades and decades. I mean, you can even look at something like Gatorade, which was literally created for elite athletes at the college level, which has now gone on to influence so many consumers um, across the globe, right? So I think more generally, what we were exposed to as entrepreneurs in sort of the digital health side of things was that no surprise hospitals don't move that fast, right? Healthcare providers don't move that fast. And that's what I think a lot of venture capital firms are covering this shift from inside the hospital to innovation happening outside of the four walls of the hospital. And that's become a big focus of ours. But then when you think about scaling that and how do you make that accessible, well, aspirationally, it makes sense to have athletes use it for the reasons that we talked through, right? Willingness to pay, willingness to try because for performance, you know, they're battling for one to 2% in performance increases. So it really makes sense for them to try any new therapy or technology. But then to your point on, okay, how do you take that and scale that to the masses? Well, I think that takes the right entrepreneur that has that vision. When we meet with an entrepreneur, we want to meet with an entrepreneur that's leveraging sport to get to a larger market, right? We don't really want to be investing in companies that are just selling to pro athletes. And I think that's got to be by design up front. It's how do you leverage that market to get to the bigger consumer, bigger generalized health play. For sure. And then, you know, another piece of that, and this is something that we've certainly seen when we're putting out the newsletter content, hosting folks on the podcast. It feels like recently, if we haven't already hit it, we're certainly approaching it. This inflection point around, you know, wanting to invest in personal well-being beyond the athlete, beyond what you would think of as, you know, digital health or digital health care. So really thinking about nutrition, uh, thinking about sports performance, thinking about just how do I make myself better overall? And there are now a number of folks, whether you think about individual angel investors or firms or family offices, that are, that are focusing on that intersection. How did you, as the, the, the fund was coming together and now making these investments, how do you think about differentiating yourself in the space and really standing out as it relates to the rest of folks that might be interested in making investments in the category? 
You know, it's a really great question because this space is certainly one that's heated up. But to be honest, we don't compare ourselves just to investors in fitness, wellness, and healthcare. Ultimately, as a fund with big aspirations, we compare ourselves to the best venture capital firms in the world. Because if you are an investor, that's what you're comparing us to when you're making an investment, right? In World Ventures, it's all venture capital at the end of the day. And those are who we're competing with for deals, right? If we're investing in the right fast growing market. So that's where we set the bar. And so with that in mind, when I consider that sort of competition, I think we're different in a few ways. I think you know, one is we've got a unique differentiated network that comes from our years in the space as entrepreneurs, as researchers, you know, in and around all the markets that we invest in. We've worked really hard to cultivate this network you know, of corporates, of strategics like pro sports leagues, of co-investors that are complementary to us. That helps us win for our portfolio companies with introductions, helps us see deal flow. Another key differentiator for us is our expertise across the markets that we invest in. We're big believers in investing where we have some know-how and when we have some experience. You know, my co-founder and I always refer to it as you know, earning the right to a point of view. And, and prior to Will Ventures, Isaiah and I were part of the founding team of a company called the Sports Innovation Lab. And that's a company uh, based in Boston and, and still thriving. And it's a leader in research, consulting, and advisory services for major corporates. And at that company, you know, it was our job to research thousands of startup companies across all the markets we invest in now and help major corporates develop technology and innovation roadmaps. So that helped us systematically think about where to invest in the themes that mattered to us, right? Through this hard fought research and expertise. And then I'd say generally, and I kind of touched on this earlier, but it's important to us. I think we're differentiated by our firm culture. At the end of the day, and I, I look at this as an advantage, we're a startup firm, right? And we know that. We've been fortunate to have a lot of smart, successful people take a bet on us in this first fund, but we've still got a lot to prove. And we are really hungry to prove them right. So we're going to fight like hell to do so. And, you know, everyone on our team <laughs> played sports through at least college. And a lot of us come from humble beginnings. So we're not a team that gets scared of hard work. We're embracing it. And at the end of the day, you know, everyone on our team is a competitor. And we're going to do whatever it takes to win as a firm. And so that's the mentality we, we bring to business building, to value, creation for our portfolio companies, everything we do. Yeah, I think the piece around, you know, having been athletes coming from humble roots certainly, you know, resonates with me. And I'm sure, as we kind of touched on earlier, um, with the the entrepreneurs and and focusing on them a little bit, I think in some of these, you know, there may be others, so you can kind of set the the record straight in terms of the numbers. But I think what's kind of publicly available, 13 or so investments out of the fund so far. Again, some of those focus areas we touched on, connected fitness, personalized nutrition some gaming, also the broader kind of sports technology space. Can you just tell us about a few of those portfolio companies and what gave you conviction around them to invest? Absolutely. So to date, you know, we've been fortunate to partner with some some great companies across all the industries that you mentioned. And I can give you, I'll give you a couple examples, but today, so we're about 15 companies invested, not all announced yet, uh, but a really exciting company that we partnered with recently and just kicked off their beta is a company called Ello that's operating in the precision nutrition market. And this is a market we've been covering closely for years. Um, Their first product um, is leveraging traditional biomarkers to provide consumers with personalized supplements, right? So how it would work is if you, Joe, sign up, you would get a blood test. And I would encourage you to do so, actually. Go to Ello.health and you can join their beta. But that blood test that you send back to Ello will help them determine what deficiencies you might have, right? And then they can use that information to ship personalized supplements that address those deficiencies. So, you know, as an example, you might discover that, you know, you have a vitamin D deficiency or your omega fatty acid ratio is off. So they can sell sell you the right personalized vitamins that can course correct, you know, your vitamin profile within your body. So as you mentioned earlier, nutrition plays a massive part in our health. But it's not a big focus for traditional healthcare providers. We see this as a huge blind spot. And there's really so much noise in nutrition. There's so many fad diets. There's so much snake oil. And I know I'm preaching to the choir on this. 
But so we're very long on science-backed nutrition and how LO is approaching the space. Another great example is a company called Breathwork, which is an LA-based company that's offering guided breathwork to help users reduce anxiety, improve endurance, increase energy, even improve sleep, right? So the interesting thing is they're, they're actually leveraging the same exercises used by not only psychologists and yoga practitioners, but also Navy SEALs and professional athletes, right? So it's this kind of blend between human performance and mindfulness. And this is a market we really love as a firm. And I'm sure you've seen, and and many of the listeners, folks like Common Headspace, right? They're two massive incumbents in the space. But despite their success, we believe there is still a significant untapped opportunity for a more mass market mindfulness product because, you know, ultimately, some of the products centered on meditation are a bit abstract and hard to master. I've, I've used quite a few of them, right, um, for years, and, and I can relate to that. And that's resulted in somewhat low conversion rates if you look at the number of folks that have downloaded these apps versus converted to paid users. So we think that indicates there's this big interest in mindfulness, but existing products sometimes, you know, they struggle to appeal to a broader market. And so that's why we're really excited by what they're doing. Another great example in the fitness space, a space that I know you guys cover very closely and very well, is a company called Lightboxer that we're very excited about, a fun company that's led by an exceptional team. Uh, the CEO, Jeff Morin, was an early employee at Form Labs, you know, a, a unicorn manufacturing and hardware company. Todd Degris, the other co-founder, formerly founded Spark Capital. He's a prolific investor. They brought on a great CMO from Hydro, Scarlet Bachelor. So a really exceptional executive team that's working on building a very differentiated model, right? And which is this light-based, rhythmic-based workout that's at the intersection of gaming and fitness, right? And that is a trend we think is going to continue to grow. Um, You know, some journalists have referred to it as almost like a dance dance revolution or a guitar hero for fitness. And it's got that kind of engagement and, and gamification to it. But one of the things we're most excited about this is it's not just the copy and paste of what Peloton has done so well. And there are a lot of players we think that have done that, right? Which is let's take what works in the boutique and move it to the home. Right. And some of them have done done it successfully, but the the space is going to get oversaturated at some point. And what we love that Lightboxer is doing is saying, how can we create an experience that doesn't exist anywhere and bring that to the home to make this really compelling fun and engaging workout. And that's a space that we think has a ton of white space, white space and that they can own. For sure. I think all three of the the ones that you decided to touch on are areas where, I mean, we could probably spend a couple of hours talking about the opportunities around precision nutrition, uh, certainly what happens in the at-home space, and then breath work and mindfulness as it relates to meditation. I think there's a huge opportunity not only to make these mainstream products, but also you can almost think of it, even though Calm isn't that old in and of itself, but you know, it's a $2 billion company now. Like what does the unbundling of Calm look like into specific, you know, focused niches? Not that, you know, Breathwork is necessarily a niche when it comes to what they're focusing on as a company, but just these ideas of how do you tailor it to different audiences who, you know, want to pursue mindfulness and meditation, but the kind of mass, you know, everything all in one super app doesn't appeal to them necessarily. So super interesting. Uh, I don't know if you have anything to add based on that, but yeah, I think it's a great point and a great observation. And I think, you know, there's not going to be a one size fits all for fitness, for healthcare, for nutrition, for mindfulness, right? And in our mind, when you look at the mass market, breathwork represents a really interesting entry point in to mindfulness for most people, right? So we think they're very differentiated in their approach and in their audience too. I mean, if, interestingly, if you went to their TikTok, you know, they've got like a million and a half followers in just a few months, right? So what they're doing is very compelling and it's clearly brought on some attention. Yeah, I think it's one thing too. And maybe a conversation to have with them. When you think about the categories, there was initially like this meditation and mindfulness, but not everybody meditates and not everybody wants to. Um, but then there was like, okay, everybody sleeps. So you have calm going into sleep stories and more of a focus around that. But also some folks, it's, you know, they have a harder time. There's a lot that goes into it from the technology and tracking and what are you eating and, 
you know, drinking throughout the day. And then there's, well, certainly everybody breathes and it's almost like low hanging fruit when it comes to how can I improve by just, you know, maybe tweaking or enhancing what I'm already doing involuntarily throughout the day anyway. Absolutely. Yeah. And actually to that point, I think the interesting thing that you hit on is something that I related to because I did meditation for years, which, was, and I see the value. I'm not trying to say there's no value in meditation, but sometimes, and this sounds ridiculous, but you know, as a busy person, I'd wake up and be like, do I just get my day started? Or do I want to allocate like 10 to 20 minutes to meditating right now? Sure. And like, that's, that's the you time that you should invest. But sometimes it'd be like, I, I got to get going. You know, I got to get my day started versus and by the way, I would only think about it that one time during the day because it was a bigger chunk of time versus breath work are these little sort of bite-sized experiences, right? This minute, two minute, three minutes that you can do um, throughout the day because they're, they're basically manipulating your parasympathetic nervous system, right? So if you want to get energized in the morning, if you want to calm, get calm before a meeting, I probably should have done a bit of breath work before this podcast, but before a big meeting or, uh, you know, when you're going to sleep, there's all these different moments that are both calm, energizing, restful, uh, performance-based. So it's something that can engage you throughout the day, which I think is very unique for a mindfulness company. Definitely. And, and down that path, we've kind of touched on some of the companies you have invested in. On the flip side, are there specific markets or opportunities that you're excited about? Maybe you wish you could find a company to back, but you haven't made an investment yet? It's a great question. And I think, you know, we've got a lot of ideas here. We're actively working and thinking through some, right? But I think there's a couple uh, of general areas that we are um, not done with, I'd say, and looking hard at. I think one is precision nutrition uh, and preventative care more generally. I think there's a massive market opportunity there. I think, you know, it's very underpenetrated. So that's an area we're definitely looking for more solutions in. Recovery is a big area that we've been spending our time in. I mean, as you look at this trend of like 30 year old plus doing more Peloton, being more active, uh, you know, as they age, there's still a really underpenetrated recovery market in our minds. So that's a big area where we're spending time. Another big market, or call it a theme, is human in the loop business models, right? And we invested in a company called Future which executes this really well. They actually take well-credentialed you know, strength coaches and fitness trainers, and they provide remote personal training with that high credential trainer, right? And this model works because for me as a consumer, rather than paying like 100 to 200 bucks a session, I'm getting the best of the best cream of the crop trainer for 150 bucks a month. So it's kind of a no-brainer, right? And for these trainers that have really high credentials, you know, some of them are strength coaches for like pro sports teams, they're massively underpaid. And so it creates this personalized model where you're using software to automate what the trainer is doing. So it's a little easier on them. And it's a great experience for the consumer. And we've done this in fitness with this investment in the future. But I think there's a lot of other opportunities within healthcare to recreate this because there's a lot of underpaid, underappreciated, you know, specialists within healthcare, within nutrition, within health and wellness where you can create a great consumer virtual experience and bring, you know, a high credential, really educated and capable healthcare provider into the loop of it to create a personalized higher touch service. So I think that's a model generally that there's still a lot of untapped opportunity. In. Yeah, I definitely agree. You think about it. I recently had, you know, Emily from uh, Wellery on the show. They're doing that with dietitians. There's a couple of different companies. Uh, one most recently launched is called Most Days. They're doing that with kind of like therapists for behavioral change. Obviously, when you go down the path, kind of at the intersection of two trends you touched on, what does that look like for the physical therapy space? Because you're talking about recovery. So obviously totally. getting that into the home, getting that one-on-one -on -one personalization. Uh, yeah, I think it's going to play out and end up being huge. And get them back to the piece around. Really quickly, sorry yeah. to cut you off, but if I could just make one point, because I think you talked a lot about unbundling and what you're talking about and all these service specific companies, it's like the unbundling of healthcare providers, yep. right? How are we unbundling PT and you know nutrition services and all of these things to make it a better consumer experience that's more convenient? So I think that's what we're seeing. And that's ultimately what consumer healthcare is. 
yeah, that playing out, but there's almost like the extension of that. And it's kind of induced by COVID, which is, you know, we, we, you know, quote unquote, but, uh, folks who are certainly have the luxury of spending the money to, you know, improve themselves from a well-being perspective to invest in, you know, whether it was a high-end gym membership or a boutique studio or a meditation app, like you were spending all this money on something, but it, at the end of the day, it like wasn't that personalized one-on-one experience that can now, you know, we're moving to, it's being delivered uh, through telemedicine, through one-on-one training and softwares like Future. Once you get that feeling of like, instead of paying $75, $150 per session, I'm paying that per month and getting this one-on-one attention. I think those, you know, those economics play out. And then on the other side of that, healthcare professionals are also saying like, Hey, you mean I don't need to see a hundred people a day, every 15 minutes on the minute. Uh, just so like it's mutually beneficial across the board. So yeah, continue seeing that play out. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And, and I think those are where some of the best investments are going to be, uh, in consumer healthcare in the next years to follow. Awesome. So, you know, zooming out a little bit and thinking about, you know, maybe early stage founders who are listening into the conversation when you're, you know, I'm sure whether it's unsolicited cold emails or folks getting connected, the number of deals, basically your job to see these companies, what criteria are you looking for when you're considering an investment? Is there a revenue number traction in terms of users? Will you guys come in, you know, pre-product or pre-revenue? What do those factors look like? It's a great question. And, you know, ultimately we're early stage investors, but we're primarily seed investors. So we want to be the first institutional capital into companies and then partner with them for multiple rounds. That's important for us. So we only invest from a point of conviction. And that's been sort of in our DNA. And I think that's part of being a research driven firm, which is we're not going to invest in 50 companies in a fund. We're going to invest more like 20 to 25 and really get our hands dirty with those companies. So for, um, you know, prospective entrepreneurs, one of the thing, or the most important thing we spend our time on is the team, right? And in particular, the management team and in particular the CEO, can she or he attract talent? Can she or he attract capital, inspire a team? I mean, that is such a critical role. And as seed investors, we're not a private equity firm that's trying to come in and change the operator, change the founder. We're backing people, right? So we spend a ton of time with CEOs and, and try to really understand them and, and, and make a bet on, do we think this person has the grit, the term, determination, the obsession to make this work? Could we see ourselves working for that person, right? Are they charismatic and a great leader? Are they high integrity people? That is you know, one of the most, if not the most critical thing. Uh, we assess in our diligence. I mean, with that, what's the unique insight that this company has, right? Does this company have subject matter expertise? And that doesn't always mean you had to work in the space for a decade. That helps. But have you done the work? Are you obsessed with this problem? We want to be able to pressure test your assumptions and for you to have thought through the hard questions. That kind of gives investors a sense of calm as they're doing their diligence. Um, and then, of course, with that, some basic things, right? Like competitive landscape um, is what you're doing differentiated. Is it defensible? We spend a ton of time in our diligence understanding this. And I think this is one of our competitive advantages, being a re- research-driven fund, is being able to spin up a lot of this work fairly quickly. Um, and of course, you know, I think the knock historically on things that are sort of sports and sports adjacent is, you know, is this venture scale? Is this niche? We are investing directly into consumer health and media, right? But we're always thinking about, of course, market size. Is this venture scale? Can this be a multi-billion dollar company? Those are the sorts of things um, that we're assessing at a very high level. Yeah, absolutely. Makes sense. And then just down that path of engaging with entrepreneurs, companies in an early stage, how do you think about your role in terms of, you know, helping them succeed or you guys more hands-on? Do you let them do the work, come to you whenever there's questions or areas, or are you kind of asserting yourself in a a more kind of helpful strategic way? Um, What does that relationship look like? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, again, because we're investing so early, we get into this eyes wide open. Like if I'm backing a company, it's we're partnering for years to come, right? Five, eight years, 10 years, we're going to be partners in this. And we don't take that lightly. You know, we take that seriously. And so from a general level, 
we look at ourselves as teammates and advisors to our portfolio company CEOs. I tell all of our portfolio company CEOs, like, we work for you. Put us to work. And I think actually for any entrepreneurs listening, this is a good thing to have front of mind always is to keep your investors busy. Ask them for things. Make them work for you. Because that's our job. It's to make your lives easier. And it's to add value to what you're doing. At the end of the day, with you know, record high venture capital dollars being put to work, you know, more and more venture capital funds being uh, founded, there's a lot of capital out there. So who you work with matters a lot. And ultimately, you want to work with people that are rolling their sleeves up, adding value, and, and grinding alongside with you. And if we don't know something, you know, we're going to tell you that. And we're going to find someone who does know that thing. That's sort of our mentality. We're a startup firm. You know, we're hungry, just like the entrepreneurs we work with. A little more specifically, you know, we're thinking about things like corporate development. You know, we're helping with fundraising and positioning. We're helping with business development. You know, we've got a, a strong relationship with you know, a lot of large corporates and, and thinking through early partnerships and how we can leverage our existing corporate network. Sales and marketing, right? How are you uh, positioning your firm? How are you scaling up your sales organization? Those are the sorts of things that we're helping our, our founders think through. Yeah. And I think, you know, folks listening, if they are operators, probably getting pretty excited by, by some of the things you touched on. Uh, I know things that would resonate with them as they think about uh, how to make their company successful. And, and actually, I think that's a, a good place to, to probably wrap up and we'll, we'll get you out of here on this. What's the best way, if folks are listening, they want to get in touch, what's the best way to, to follow along uh, and get on your radar? First of all, to anyone that's listened up to this point, thank you so much. It would be great to hear from you and to connect with you know any entrepreneur or person that's willing to, to reach out. You can visit our site at willventures.com where you can sign up for our newsletter. Stay up to date on the latest and greatest from the firm. Follow us on Twitter, you know, at Will Ventures or my personal Twitter at Brian Riley VC. And on LinkedIn, you know, we, we try to make ourselves accessible to inbound. So LinkedIn is a great way to reach out and get in touch. Well, awesome, Brian. Listen, this was a great conversation. Uh, hope folks find a lot of value in it. I, I sure think that they will. And uh, I appreciate you making time to join us. Greatly appreciate you having me, Joe. Again, congrats on your success. And thanks so much for the time. Thanks everyone for listening to today's episode. For more from Fit Insider, visit insider.fit.co and subscribe to our weekly newsletter for insights and analysis on the business of fitness and wellness. Then go ahead and subscribe, rate, and review the podcast. See you next time.